This is part 31 of Razor Pages tutorial. In this video, we'll discuss what is repository pattern and its benefits. We'll also look at an example of using it in a Razor Pages project. What is a repository pattern? Well, repository pattern is an abstraction of the data access layer. It hides the details of how data is saved or retrieved from the underlying data source. The details of how data is stored and retrieved is in the respective repository. For example, you may have a repository that stores and retrieves data from an in-memory collection. You may have another repository that stores and retrieves data from a database like SQL Server. Yet another repository that stores and retrieves data from an XML or CSV file. For example, consider this I employee repository interface. By looking at this interface, we can only tell what operations, that is methods, that are supported by this repository. If we take a look at the project we've been working with, we have our I employee repository interface here, and these are all the methods that are present in this interface. Search, get all employees, get employee, etc. By looking at this interface declaration, we can only tell what this interface is capable of doing, but not how it actually does that. For example, this method get employee takes an ID of the employee and returns us that specific employee object. But we don't know the details of from where it's going to retrieve that employee. It's going to retrieve it from an in-memory collection, database, CSV, or an XML file. All these details are present in the respective repository. So, in short, this repository interface, iEmployee repository, contains what it can do, but not how it does. The implementation details are in the respective repository class that implements this iEmployee repository interface. At the moment, in our project, we have only one implementation and that is mock employee repository. This specific implementation, as the name implies, stores and retrieves employees from an in-memory collection. If we take a look at our project, here is the mock employee repository. Notice it implements iEmployee repository interface and this class contains the details of how the interface methods are implemented. So far in this video series, we have been working with employees from an in-memory collection and we want to change that in this video. We want to work with employees from a SQL Server database. So for that, we are going to provide another implementation for this iEmployee repository interface and that is SQL Employee Repository. This specific implementation stores and retrieves employees from a SQL Server database. All of our data access services are present in this services project. Notice both our iEmployee repository interface and mock employee repository implementation are present in this project. Let's also add our SQL employee repository to this project. Let's name our class SQL employee repository. The first thing that we want to do is make the class public and implement the interface I employee repository. Notice when I press control period, we get the option to implement interface and when I press the enter key, all the interface methods are stubbed out. Now, to be able to store and retrieve employees from a SQL Server database, we need an instance of this app DB context class inside our SQL employee repository. We implemented this class in our previous videos in this series. To get an instance of this class inside our SQL employee repository, we are going to make use of dependency injection. So let's include a constructor for our SQL employee repository. Include a parameter of type app DB context and let's call this parameter context. Notice when I press control period, I get the option to create and initialize a private field with the name context. Next, we need to provide implementation for all these interface methods. Let's start with this add method. This method adds the employee to the employees database table and that's straightforward. On the context object, we have employees property which has the collection of employees and to this we want to add our new incoming employee. And then on the context, call save changes. And finally, return the new employee. Delete implementation is also straightforward on context.employees property. Let's use find method to find the employee by ID. Let's store the found employee in a variable of type employee. Let's call the variable employee. If employee variable is not equal to null, that means we have found the employee. So on context.employees, let's call the remove method and remove the employee. 
and then as usual call save changes and then finally return the employee. Next, as the name implies, this method returns the employee count by department. We already have an implementation for this method within our mock employee repository. So in the interest of time, let's copy the implementation we already have and then change the bits that are required. The only change that we need here is instead of using this variable, let's use context.employees and we still see these red squigglies under these link extension methods where and group by. That's because we are missing system.link namespace. So let's bring that in. Get all employees method returns the list of all employees. So let's return context.employees. Next, get employee. This method finds and returns a specific employee whose ID is equal to this incoming ID. So return context.employees.find and to this we pass the incoming ID. Search implementation for this method is going to be very similar to what we already have in mock employee repository. So let's copy and change the bits that are required. In these two places where we see red squigglies, instead of using the private list field underscore employee list, let's use context.employees. Finally, update. Let me paste the code and then I'll walk you through it. We attach the incoming updated employee object using the attach method and then we set the state of that object to modified so entity framework core knows it has to update the respective employee object and then as usual we call save changes method and return the updated employee object. This completes our implementation of SQL employee repository. At the moment we have two implementations mock employee repository, SQL employee repository and then in our individual razor pages like this index, edit and delete we have injected this I employee repository interface using dependency injection. Now the question is how does ASP.NET Core know which implementation to use mock employee repository or SQL employee repository? Well the answer for that is in configure services method of the startup class. If we take a look at our project Notice we are still using mock employee repository. So with this line in place, when these pages that is index, edit and delete requires I employee repository, ASP.NET Core is going to provide an instance of mock employee repository. But we want to change that. We want to use SQL employee repository instead. We need to make one more change for registering SQL employee repository. Instead of using add singleton method, we must use add scope. We are using this method because we want SQL employee repository instance to be alive and available for the entire scope of the given HTTP request. For another new HTTP request, a new instance of SQL employee repository class will be provided and it will be available throughout the entire scope of that HTTP request. We discuss the difference between these different service registration methods, add singleton, add scoped and add transient in detail in part 44 of our ASP.NET Core tutorial. With this one line of code throughout our entire application, in all the places where I employee repository is injected, an instance of SQL employee repository is provided. If you want your application to use a different implementation instead, all you need to change is this one line. There are many benefits of using the repository pattern. The code is cleaner, easier to reuse and maintain, enables us to create loosely coupled systems. For example, if we want our application to work with an Oracle database instead of SQL Server database, implement an Oracle repository that knows how to read and write to Oracle database and then register the Oracle repository with the dependency injection system. Along the same lines, in a unit testing project, it is easy to replace a real repository with a fake implementation for testing. With the changes that we have made so far, let's run our project and take a look at the browser. We are on the home page. Let's navigate to the list page. Notice the page is empty. That's because if we take a look at the employees database table, we don't have any rows here. So let's add a new employee. Name of the employee is Sarah. 
Email is here at presumetech.com. Department is IT. Let's also upload a photo. There we go. Our new employee is added. I'm going to add a few more employees. In the interest of time, let me do it offline. There we go. I have added five employees in total. Three in IT, one in HR, and one in payroll. We can see all those five employees here. And if we take a look at the database table, we have the respective employee records here as well. Now, let's quickly verify if all of our CRUD operations, create, read, update, and delete, work as before. Create works because we have just added five employees. List also works fine. We see all those five employees here. Let's try edit now. Change the name of this employee from John to John1. Similarly, email to John1 at presumetech.com. And let's change his department to HR. Save. If we view this employee details, notice the details are updated as expected. Let's try delete finally. Let's delete this employee record. We have the delete confirmation. Let's click yes. The record is deleted. We now only have four employees. And if we take a look at the database table and refresh this, the respective record is gone from here as well. That's it in this video. Thank you for listening.